Martin, first of all, uh, I want to thank you for uh, putting this meeting together and for inviting me to come. Uh, on behalf of TAP Air Portugal, I want to present excuses for canceling my flight without warning. And without further ado, I'll go into the talk. Um, so I, I named it metabolic adaptation as defense strategy uh, against infection. But given the scope of the meeting, I would like to keep it a little bit conceptual, and in the end, I'll see how much data I'll be able to <clears throat> share with you. So the first point I would like to make is that pathogens express virulent factors, and it turns out that most of this are actually um, geared, if you will, to capture vital nutrients from their hosts. And this is a real, I think, important theme in immunology that it's not really uh, appreciated to the full extent, I would say. So as a defense mechanism, uh, there is nutritional immunity, and uh, you will see we coined this now innate nutritional immunity, and the aim is to prevent pathogens from accessing vital nutrients. We think this is a very important resistance mechanism, and it's perhaps a vital function of innate immunity, again, not fully appreciated. Now, as innate immunity uh, 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 becomes operational, uh, it needs to be coupled, as you will see, with the uh, metabolic reprogramming of the infected host. And I will dwell in that in some detail. Um, this metabolic reprogramming is at the basis of what we call tissue damage control. And this is critical to establish disease tolerance for infection. And the last uh, concept or detail I'll give you, I'll add another one in the end, is that <clears throat> tissue damage control is regulated by a transcriptional stress and damage response network. So I'm going to start by just uh, the very basics of, um, of why um, pathogens express virulent factors that are geared to take out vital nutrients. And this can be actually expanded to several nutrients or several uh, metabolites. But I'll be focusing on iron, which is absolutely essential to support life. If anything else, Oh, sorry, if nothing else, iron is required to support the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. And I don't know if you see my arrow, um, but I'm pointing to the left side here. And what I'm trying to put is in, uh, in perspective here is that iron can exchange electrons, and that's essential in the first equation there um, to support, for example, the electron transport chain. But uh, this exchange of electrons can also be dangerous, let's call it like that, and lead to oxidative stress. So there must be a very tight regulation of iron availability and reactivity in cells. The other thing I would like to stress is that 20 to 25% of the iron uh, is actually catalytic iron, if you will. It's bound in a way or another to uh, an acceptor protein or to lipids. But the large majority, about 75 to 80%, is actually... Uh, conjugated or uh, inserted into a molecule called IM, which is a protoporphyrin ring. And this is actually part of uh, vital proteins to our survivor. If nothing else, hemoglobin carries about 70% of these IM uh, uh, prosthetic molecules that contain iron. Myoglobin carries about 5 to 10%, and every other cell expresses IM proteins, and they account for about 20 to 25%. And the corresponding cells for these are red blood cells, muscle cells, and other cells, as I just said. Now, the other point that is critical, and I'm not going to uh, uh, dwell on the details here, is that you, you see here a hemophagocytic macrophage, and macrophages are really critical to maintain iron homeostasis because they capture red blood cells that contain the large majority of the iron. They have this very exquisite uh, uh, system to transport and catabolize. Uh, uh, in, they extract the iron, they export it via this ferroportin receptor, they bring it now to another cell compartment via transferrin, and each cell is now going to use this iron to resynthesize in and put it again into these critical uh, proteins that I just referred to. The majority goes into the red blood cell compartment, and the number that I put there, 5, 10 to the 6, I just put it because it's really staggering in humans. Hemophagocytic macrophages take about 5 million uh, senescent red blood cells per second. So this is a very, very active process. Of course, when we get infected, 
um, pathogens must access iron. That's the only place where they can get it from. It's from their host. So they go into different compartments of this iron uh, homeostatic process. They can go straight into uh, hemophagocytic macrophages and, and invade uh, hemophagocytic macrophages. Salmonella does that, for example. They can use siderophores that actually grab the iron and push them towards microbial usage. They can use uh, surrogates of transferrin receptors to take the iron in the form of transferrin, or they can actually uh, uh, invade red blood cells. Plasmodium, the causative agent of malaria, does that. Uh, most bacteria express in a way or another emolysins to extract actually iron from red blood cells. And a lot of pathogens, I'll give you an example, actually evolve to extract iron from hemoglobin and then extract the in where the iron is contained. Now, this takes us to the second point, which is nutritional immunity, which is the infected host cannot be silent in face of this robbery, if you will. And there's many ways of looking at this. Uh, and we put this together in a, in a fairly recent review with Gabriel Nunes. The usual way we see this interaction is that we sense or innate immune cells sense the presence of microbes via pattern recognition receptors. They send a signal one, which is this sensing here. And then there's an effector function one, which is, for example, the production of free radicals, reactive oxygen species, or reactive nitrogen species that provide resistance to infections. This is very evolutionary conserved. What I've just told you about is that there's another effector function that emerges after sensing of the, of the pathogens, which is to with all vital nutrients such as iron from getting to microbes. And we think actually these two pathways are integrated and there's data to support that in which the effective function one, which is killing is actually coupled to the effective function two, which is starving. Uh, for example, free radicals <coughs> can actually regulate uh, the expression of iron regulatory genes that capture iron and actually provide nutritional immunity. So resistance to infection is, uh, uh, comprises at least taking out vital nutrients from microbes and at, and at the same time generating effector molecules that kill those microbes. I'm going to give you an example from Gabriel uh, Nunes' uh, uh, laboratory in which I was fortunate uh, to collaborate, but it's really coming from their lab. So here is a microbe being sensed by different innate immune cells. At the same time, it's producing hemolysin, damaging red blood cells, uh, uh, extracting hemoglobin, uh, sorry, releasing hemoglobin and extracting IM to be used. Uh, there's a bystander effect of IM that paralyzes innate immune cells. This was um, uh, identified uh, by Wilmer uh, and Silver Knapp's lab in uh, Austria a few years back. And these innate immune cells now secrete cytokines, which are inflammatory cytokines, such as IL 6, very classically, but also IL 22 that is now touching a non-canonical uh, cell uh, in, in immune uh, um, in immunity, which is an hepatocyte. But actually, the hepatocyte is now producing molecules that capture hemoglobin, uh, albumin that captures IM, or hemopaxin as well that captures IM. So this nutritional immunity can rely on cells that are not bona fide cells of the immune system. And it's important afterwards as well to capture the iron, uh, uh, for example, immunopaxin will be captured by this receptor, optoglobulin by this receptor here, and now actually through in catabolism to recover this iron and recycle it back. Um, so what we see appearing here is cells that we usually not associate with resistance mechanisms against infection. I'll give you other examples, such as mopatocyte, in this case, in the context of nutritional immunity. So just to illustrate the data from Gabriel Nunes' lab, um, so we used mice that actually are wild type, or they deleted for aptoglobulin, deleted for imopaxin, or deleted for both uh, of uh, these molecules, Oop. and infects them uh, with Cetrobacter potentium. And then here, we're just looking at pathogen load. And as the infection progresses from day one to day 10, you'll appreciate that in the absence of aptoglobulin and imopexin, there's actually a, a one to two logs difference in pathogen load, really showing that this mechanism to take out uh, immoglobulin by aptoglobulin and 
in by imapaxin is really critical in this host pathogen interaction. So I'm going to move on with the idea that this nutritional immunity must be coupled to metabolic reprogramming. I'm going to kind of allude to this briefly, and then in the end of the talk, I'm going to give more details. So the general idea, and I'll give you some data for this, is that <clears throat> once we're infected, so at steady state, sorry, before infection, we take our nutrients from food. Uh, obviously, these nutrients actually are processed I mean, different organs, but uh, the real hub, metabolic hub, is the liver, and we produce metabolites that are essential to sustain the functional vital organs, such as the brain and the heart, that are also essential, actually, to sustain uh, the function of immune cells. Now, in the presence of pathogens, and these can be actually viruses, fungi, or protozoan parasites, or bacteria, it doesn't quite matter, uh, we have pattern recognition receptors that sense these microbes, and now there's resistance mechanisms, including innate nutritional immunity. So innate nutritional immunity becomes really critical because if nothing was done, then pathogens would be actually, and they do that, they would be taking nutrients directly from our food, they would be taking it after ingestion, or they can actually take metabolites directly from the liver or from any organs. So Inflammation, which is the first reaction we do to the presence of pathogenic microorganisms, actually shifts all of this to the right side here. And it's actually, as I will uh, provide some evidence for, uh, it's actually shutting down or reducing very much the production of metabolites in the liver. It communicates with the brain to induce anorexia infection. We stop eating. I will not show uh, data for that. And it does something pretty spectacular that I also will not show, which is it's going to use a different resource of energy coming from the adipose tissue instead of coming from the liver. And by doing that, actually, it's rewiring metabolism so that microbes cannot get access to it. And in this last superposition here, uh, it's to tell you that we've shown this from malaria that EM is acting directly on the immune system. It will be acting directly on the liver. I'll show you data for that. And it acts in different compartments, but I will not be uh, providing data for that. So how does the infected host does this uh, reprogramming? Um, uh, and, and what is the output of that? So in the next couple of slides, I will, I will convey to you that the output is what we call tissue damage control. And I'll, I'll be more uh, detailed on what that is. And the tissue damage control is what establishes disease tolerance to infection. And I will also be defining what it is. So the first thing is to define disease tolerance. So we're all aware of resistance mechanisms against infection. Uh, those are the product of immune cells, bona fide immune cells. And as I alluded to before, they're geared actually to reduce pathogen burden or, or uh, ideally to eliminate it. Uh, big elements uh, like Judy Allen uh, uh, likes to study. Uh, actually, those are very, very difficult to eliminate. So you expel them, or at least you try to expel them. So the resistance mechanisms need to be adapted and tailored to what type of pathogen. But the resistance mechanisms are always uh, to target pathogens and, and ideally to eliminate them or to contain them um, at a given spot. Now, there's an equally important defense mechanism. Uh, against infection that was uh, actually identified originally in the plant literature. And the big difference with resistance mechanisms is that it does not target pathogens directly. It, it does not aim at reducing pathogen burden. So instead, what it does is to make, let's call it everything else. It makes that our vital organs can keep functioning despite the situation where the immune system is deploying very toxic molecules and consuming a lot of energy to proliferate towards clearing the pathogen. So sometimes I'm tempted to say it's a parallel pathway, but it's not, or it's a parallel defense strategy, but it's not parallel. It's actually intermingled with, uh, uh, with immune cells. We just don't know the mechanisms by which these two systems communicate. So I'm going to have a couple of slides now um, to integrate tissue damage control into this uh, disease tolerance mechanism. So on the left side, pathogen burden. And on the right side, host fitness that we don't need to define here. Or we can, in, you know, in medical terms, we can equate it with health. In biological terms, the capacity to uh, actually transmit genes to the progeny. 
So pathogen burden imposes damage uh, that reduces host fitness and uh, the host reacts by resistance mechanisms here in RNA. Now, we came to learn from diseases, for example, such as sepsis, that resistance has a trade-off in which it can cause damage to tissues that reduce host fitness. And some infectious diseases, such as sepsis, are actually characterized <clears throat> by this type of damage that actually is the real cause of death. Now, we know now that there are these tissue damage control mechanisms that operate to limit the damage without touching the pathogen. So if you follow these white arrows here, uh, tissue damage control by targeting the damage actually increases or sustains old fitness without actually reducing pathogen burden. And we can add another one here in which the damage emanating from the immune system is also being dealt with. Now, this allows actually to reduce the damage, but with persistence resistance. So we think that the limit of immune-driven resistance mechanisms is imposed by tissue damage control mechanisms. You can only operate an immune system to the boundaries imposed by tissue damage control. If not, resistance mechanisms will become pathological and will be the cause of death. When everything works fine, which is the huge majority of cases, now pathogen burden gets reduced, resistance mechanisms uh, are actually downregulated by negative feedback loops. You don't require this, but then there's another uh, interesting aspect, which is these tissue damage control mechanisms must themselves be turned off um, because there's a trade-off related to this. We can discuss that afterwards so that return to homeostasis can operate. So I'm going to go uh, very quickly here. We think that evolutionarily, perhaps the first thing that uh, uh, that emerged was this tissue damage control mechanism. This is an hypothetic infection at time zero to time 14. Um, and uh, there's three phases here, sensing, induction, repair, and tissue regeneration. Now you require actually tissue damage control mechanisms to be operational here in blue, such that you can now impose innate and adaptive immunity, but restraining actually uh, the associated dysfunction and damage that I impose. So basically you need to set up uh, uh, a protective mechanism for vital organs so that the immune system can now operate without compromising the survival of the infected host. And we put this forward in the annual reviews uh, in 2019. Now, another way of looking at this, which is less uh, uh, schematic, but I think more informative, was put forward by David Schneider, Stanford University, of a few years back. And it relates to a uh, disease trajectory. So I'm gonna to move to the next slide because that really gives you how this disease trajectory is operate. And we use them a lot actually because we find them very, very useful to understand uh, uh, the interaction between disease tolerance and resistance mechanisms. So um, on the y-axis here, uh, 10 is health and fitness to the maximum. So very healthy. And then it degrades until zero, which is death. And we're plotting this against pathogen burden in arbitrary units and it's a, a, a hypothetical log scale. So as the pathogen starts growing, you will see after, until this point here, until 10 to the fifth um, CFUs for a bacteria, there's no reduction in health or fitness. But after that point, actually you see that the health uh, of the OS is getting reduced until a second inflection point here between uh, mild disease and severe disease, and this is actually the product of resistance mechanisms. So these, these trajectories inflect to, the, inf, inflect to the left because immune-driven resistance mechanisms are operating. Uh, they're reducing pathogen burden, but with a tremendous trade-off because as you reduce pathogen burden, actually the disease becomes more and more severe. So if you focus, for example, at 10 to the fifth year of, uh, of pathogen burden, if you're in the upper part of the disease trajectory, you don't want to treat a patient like that with a, sorry, you want to treat the patient like that with an antimicrobial uh, agent because you don't want the pathogen burden to increase and reduce uh, health of the host. But if you are in the end point of this curve here where you have very severe disease, uh, the, the disease is being promoted not by the pathogen anymore, but by the reaction against the pathogen. 
and removing the pathogen does not increase actually the health of the <clears throat> of the host. Uh, and to do that, actually, you require uh, other mechanisms that bring it back uh, all the way up. So to wrap up uh, on this schematic presentation, I'll give you some examples of this. Everything that brings actually um, these graphs from the right side to the left side are resistance mechanisms. I put on purpose very low uh, and parallel <clears throat> uh, and parallel to um, to these very severe form to tell you that resistance can really be decoupled from recovery of health. And to recover health, you need uh, disease tolerance mechanisms that are actually evolved to do just that. So. In other terms, if you want to treat infectious diseases, you need, of course, not to ignore resistance mechanisms that nobody's putting that in doubt, but you need to consider disease tolerance mechanisms because that's what makes us recover health. So where do we study this? You can study this with any pathogen, but malaria actually um, gives us a very good example. So this is a hypothetical uh, African population exposed uh, to mosquitoes in an endemic area of malaria. So we're going to consider that this is endemic, that these people are being actually beaten by infected mosquitoes, and about 25 to 75 percent of these population will be infected eventually. And then a fraction of those uh, will develop severe malaria, and a fraction of those will eventually die from it. So one question that we can ask is that in endemic areas, of malaria, why do some people develop severe malaria and eventually die from it? And others are infected, but they don't go on to develop severe disease, even though they have the same pathogen burden and they don't succumb from the infection. So let's dwell a little bit more in detail of malaria. The, the most affected uh, population segment that you want are uh, children under the age of five, um, and they can develop very severe symptoms uh, from falciparum malaria, <clears throat> in particular cerebral malaria. Um, the disease is transmitted by mosquito. Uh, it drops the parasite in the skin. The parasite goes to the liver. This is all asymptomatic. But then the parasite goes exactly where the iron is, which is the red blood cells. And there it starts cycling almost perpetually and lies in red blood cells. So this is the strategy of this parasite. You went to the... <laughs> to the vault where the gold is, uh, to the biggest source of iron, and it takes actually hemoglobin as a source of proteins. Now, the disease uh, associated with malaria varies a lot, and it's all associated with the, what we call the blood stage of infection. Now, you can study this in many ways. Uh, one way of studying this is to use rodent plasmodium strains, and now we use mice, and by changing the strain of plasmodium and the strain of mice, you can now fine tune what uh, disease outcome do you get? And you can actually get all the disease outcomes that occur in humans just by playing with the genetic background of the plasmodium strain and the mouse strain. So this is exactly what Lars Bradberg did with Andrew Reed in 2007 in a, a paper that, at least for us, is absolutely seminal. And what he did here is to change the mouse strains and took a very simple assumption, which is, uh, these strains are genetically defined, they're inbred. So I'm going to analyze, oh, <laughs> Andrew and Lars uh, said, we're going to analyze whether this genetic variation impacts on disease tolerance mechanisms. And here, uh, they were not using disease trajectories fully as, um, um, as David Schneider put for it. This was a little bit before. So they're using these slopes here. And you see, actually, if you plot um, pathogen uh, burden in the x-axis. And here you're plotting actually <clears throat> anemia sever severity. It's more severe as you go down. You see actually for the same pathogen burden, for example, at two, the blue strain here has much less anemia compared to the red strain. So the blue strain is DBA, the red strain is 67 black six. So there is a genetic variation for the development of anemia, which is controlled uh, uh, I'm going to say the same word again, genetically in, the, in these two different strains, uh, but it's independent of pathogen burden. So with the same pathogen burden, actually, <clears throat> they develop uh, differences in severity of disease. Uh, they did this for uh, um, uh, loss of uh, weight as well. I'm not going to dwell on that. And then through fairly simple equations, uh, 
they realized that uh, the level of disease tolerance and resistance mechanisms, I'm sorry, there should be a, I'm sorry, there should be a resistance mechanism here. Actually, these mouse strains segregate. The ones that are more tolerant, they're less resistant, and the ones that are more resistant are less tolerant, which is very important, and, um, but we don't know the molecular basis for these yet. So how do these systems of, or, or, or this defense strategy of disease tolerance operate? So I'm going to put forward that it does it via transcriptional stress and damage response network, and I'm going to give you some data for that. So again, a cartoonish way, you see again the pathogens and the, and the immune system. This is usually how immunologists operate. I'm adding now virulence factors uh, on the left side that I told you are there to kidnap nutrients. And the immune system now is operating with a trade-off, which is immunopathology. So we're all aware that these can cause different levels of stress and damage, and I'll be very detailed in defining those. Uh, and this stress and damage can be countered by the cells themselves that are exposed to this stress and damage via transcriptal stress and damage response network. I'm sorry, I need to take some more. <laughs> And this is the molecular basis for disease tolerance. So the stress and damage response network involves at least six intranscription factors. Each one of this, which are these triangles here in pink, and each one of this responds to one form of, of stress. Now, if you look now at the full genome uh, of, of a mammalian host, and you ask how many genes have one uh, um, DNA binding site for one of these transcription factors, this indicates that just by itself, the activation of this transcription factor could actually induce the expression of the gene. So some of these, for example, NRF2 can activate 33 genes by itself, 53 is much more potent. So I call this the private life of the transcription factors. If you do the same exercise now and you ask how many genes are responding to two of these transcription factors, three, four, five, six, seven, or more, one realizes that there's a hierarchical structure on the effector genes that are responding with a number of genes that are core to the, to, the, uh, to the network. And I'll come back to these core effector genes, but this is telling us that some genes, some effector genes are more important than others in terms of responding to all types of different stress and damage uh, that can occur in these parenchyma cells. So why am I uh, uh, differentiating stress and damage? Usually we call these stress responses. So stress is something that is preemptive. It's an event that is occurring in a cell, but it didn't cause damage yet. So for example, you can have a toxin or you can have redox dysregulation. You can have a change of oxygen pressure. You can have a change of osmolarity. You can have multiple uh, metabolic differences. There's no damage imposed, but, but cells have sensors for all of this. Why? Because they know that they cannot keep functioning if there's this regulation of, for example, oxygen pressure. Right? There's going to be hypoxia, and you need to uh, activate a stress response, for example, that would provide metabolic adaptation to hypoxia, or that provide metabolic adaptation to hypoxia with accumulation of free radicals, for example. Right? So this is first step of metabolic adaptation that actually is one of the underlying mechanisms for tissue damage control. You, have, you avoid the damage and actually you make that, for example, the heart through these cardiac myocytes adapts to these forms of stress so that you can at least ensure um, the minimal requirements for circulation actually to be maintained if we're talking about the heart. But you can <clears throat> expand these two arms every vital organ. Now, this is an underlying mechanism for disease tolerance. Now, the, the participants on this pathway all have names. So this is for uh, hypoxia. This is for oxidative stress. The transcription factors are in red. This is NRF2. The first one was ethan alpha. For metabolic stress, you have MPK. For multiple forms of stress, you have FOXO uh, uh, transcription factors. And for osmolarity, you have this NFAT5. So we don't have time to go through this, but this is not uh, elusive, actually. These, there are 
research areas that are dedicated only to understand uh, these patterns. So let's go briefly now through damage responses. Damage responses are a step after the stress. Now you can have toxins, but now, for example, <clears throat> you can have unfolded proteins and you will activate the unfolded protein response. You can have damage to organelles, you can have damage to DNA, damage to lipids, or damage to fully folded proteins. So here you need to deal with this differently. The damage is already made. So metabolic adaptation per se is not sufficient. You need to activate damage responses that do damage repair. And you need to tailor it for what type of damage the cell has and activate specific pathways for that. Ultimately, that's the second layer of tissue damage control that establishes disease tolerance to infection. Now, when this becomes maladaptive, what I mean is that when once these damage responses cannot repair the damage imposed, they're actually linked uh, to a default pathway that we'll call maladaptive here. And now they will induce cell death because you don't want to have ghost cells that accumulate damage to DNA, but still survive. This is extremely dangerous and will lead to a tumor, for example. Now you're eliminating the cells. If this process is not stopped, you start getting tissue damage. Depending on the tissue, this can actually touch a vital organ, for example, the heart, and then you have severe disease and you die. Now these two things, so again, we know the names and the pathways for these and call the protein response. The each shock with this HSF1 is the major transcription factor there. ATM uh, protein kinase is critical for DNA damage responses, but not exclusive, of course, and for organelles, autophagy. Uh, <clears throat> so just to, again, to illustrate the point that, that we collectively as scientists know a lot about uh, this pathway. So in the next slide, I'm gonna integrate for you the stress and the damage responses and why I think it's important to separate them. So it is the cluster of stress responses doing what it should do, metabolic adaptation, tissue damage control and disease tolerance. Now, imagine the stress, the source of stress like a, a bacteria, it's not dealt with. So the bacteria increases, it's taking nutrients, it's changing osmolarity, it's ch changing redox type, status is taking glucose like plasmodium does, dropping uh, glycemia, now cells starting accumulating damage. So the stress response became maladaptive, is not sufficient. So this will cause different forms of damage to proteins, to lipids, to DNA, to organelles. And now you couple these to damage repair and you come in and you give it a second layer in the damage control pathway to establish disease tolerance. And again, when this becomes maladaptive, that's when you develop very severe disease. <clears throat> All right, so the next question is that, is disease tolerance dependent upon individual transcriptional master regulators of the stress and damage response network? So this is another representation of the stress and damage response network. And we're gonna focus on this guy here, it's called NRF2, and is the transcription factor that responds to oxidative stress. So I'm bringing back this slide uh, to tell you what's the expectation from the role of a transcription factor like an RF2. So we should be op operational on the upper. I don't know if you can see my arrow. I should have asked this before. Can somebody put a thumb up or thumb down if you see it or not? Oh, you see it. Great. Thank you. So, so it's, this is a, uh, the pathway uh, regulated by an RF2. It's just here. And in biology, we use a lot, lots of function approaches, and we are <laughs> we are gifted that the, the our field has evolved that we can do tissue specific loss of function, genetic loss of function approach. So we can take out this transcription factor uh, globally or from a specific cell, and basically ask, would all of this system crumble and go all the way to disease tolerance? So what I'm saying is there, if you remove the circle here, the expectation, which is very, the redox stress stays there, but this should all come this way, if this is really important in a given circumstance. I have to say that we did the experiments before conceptualizing it. And if I would have conceptualized it, I would have not done the experiments anyway. So how do you do that? We knock out specifically uh, uh, this gene, for example, NRF2. And one important aspect here is that 
these are stress responsive genes and we maintain mice at SPF, SPF uh, conditions. So by taking out stress responses, usually we don't actually change the steady state or the vigor of these mice. And we assess for that these, these mice are actually normal until a certain age. Now we can challenge them while they're young with plasmodium in this case, and we look at survival. And what we saw actually is that uh, uh, you can see here uh, the knockouts, they die much more than the wild types, right? And there's different systems that we've done this. Now, if you look at pathogen burden, here we're looking at percentage of parasitemia, but I'll be more detailed afterwards. There's no change whatsoever. So this suggests that the transcription factor that is dealing to oxidative stress can be really vital to protect mice from succumbing to malaria, but it does it in a way that it's not targeting the pathogen. So what it's doing is contributing to disease tolerance mechanisms. So is it doing tissue damage control? It is, because when we look at serological markers of tissue damage, for example, a global one called LDH, you see that they only really come up when you knock out an RF2. And you can do this for other ones, for example, liver damage marker AST, um, creatinine kinase, which is a muscle uh, damage marker, or urea that indicates that the kidneys are not functioning uh, uh, properly. So you only see a rise of these markers when the transcription factor is not there, inferring that the trans transcription factor is providing tissue damage control and making that these organs uh, or these tissues keep functioning. So I'm gonna push it a little bit further. And now I'm gonna ask whether these transcription factors are really operational outside of bona fide immune cells, right? So here what we did is a genetic manipulation that we're very keen to, <laughs> which is uh, uh, called ribotag. And ribotag basically is you tag ribosomes in a tissue specific manner. And here we've done it specifically on renal proximal tubular epithelial cells. And I don't have the time to, to tell you, but we can discuss how we got here. And basically, if you take the kidneys from these mice, and if you do RNA sac, you're doing actually, uh, you're analyzing what genes are being translated specifically in renal proximal tubular epithelial cells. Okay, so you can just take the organ and ask for that. And we did that after plasmodium infection. And here is the analysis. So we see uh, a lot of things we don't fully understand yet. Uh, very exciting ones, uh, at least to us. Type 1 interfering response, very strong. And type 2 interfering response. I suppose you cannot see all the words there, but these cells, they look like they became antigen pre presenting cells. They have all the machinery to do that. We have another cluster here, which is iron homeostasis. And we have a huge cluster here, which is all this NRF2 dependent pathway, regulated pathway. So now we can ask, this is NRF2 in red there. I just highlighted it. And we can ask, is NRF2 expression in the cell compartment uh, important to protect mass from uh, malaria? So we do that via genetic manipulation. And this NRF2 Pepsi, uh, Pepsi K really means that we're taking out NRF2 only from renal proximal tubal epithelial cells and actually only from one segment. We infect them. And now we reacquire exactly the same uh, survival disadvantage that we had with the global knockout. Okay. Now you might say, well, <clears throat> you, if you take out the transcription pack like this from any other cell compartment, you might see the same thing. And that's not, I'm sorry, it doesn't change pathogen burden. And if we do the same uh, analysis by taking out NRF2 specifically from hepatocytes, actually there's no survival disadvantage. And this serves at least as a proof of concept to tell you that this is very tissue specific. What tissues are exposed to oxidative stress, what cells, and, uh, and it's gonna depend uh, um, uh, on what tissue, what uh, transcription factors they're gonna use to provide tissue damage control and disease tolerance. Why do we say disease tolerance? Because if you look at pathogen burden, now really the number of pathogens circulating per microliter, there's absolutely no difference whatsoever. Now, I would like to touch now on the 
on the core uh, effect genes on the network. Remember, I told you that the network was hierarchical and there's a number of core effect genes. And these, these two ones on the right side, actually, <clears throat> once they go red, they're repressed. Once they go green, they're induced. And the combination of these two will tell a cell you cannot proliferate. But the other one is really bizarre. The other one is emoxygenase 1. And it's bizarre, why? Because emoxygenase 1 is a gene that actually does one thing, which is to cleave the proliferin ring of in. Remember, I was telling you, this is where most of the iron is. And it does that with two electron acceptors, so it requires a lot of energy and a lot of glucose to produce, for example, NADPH through the pentose phosphate pathway, because this is the electron donor. It cuts the ring and it releases iron, carbon monoxide, and it produces biliverdin. So this is the reaction of this core element gene of the transcription network. So I'm gonna drive you back to this data set uh, and, and ask in this specific context, is emoxygenase one there? And it's there, it's very close to an RF2. It's very big, so it means that there's a lot of regulation of emoxygenase one. So we can ask the same question. We can say, if we infect the mouse, I'm sorry, <clears throat> So it's there, I'm sorry, I, I made a little mistake here. Uh, and I'm gonna illustrate exactly what it is. So if you infect the mouse and now look for emoxygenase one by Western blood uh, in different organs, it is actually, we had published this before, it is a pregulate in the liver, in the spleen as one would expect. But see here, the kidney, it's really uh, uh, very, very strong. And if we zoom now in the kidney, the red, uh, dots here are uh, renal proximal tubular epithelial cells stained by this GGT1. And this is PCC, is after infection. So when it becomes blue, that means that these cells are expressing in oxygenase one. We can zoom in. Um, this is not infected. See, they have a little bit trace of oxygenase one. But once they get activated, they look like a Christmas tree, at least to me. Uh, they really uh, upregulate a lot of oxygenase one. So we can use now the same approach and knock out this core effect gene just from renal proximal tubular epithelial cells. We infect the mice and we ask what happens. And see, these mice also succumb to infection, but the phenotype, let's call it, is stronger than the NRF2. And this took us a long time to understand what counts as the effect of genes is not the transcription factors around. There's many ways of getting to the core genes, but if you touch the core genes, that's really where the problem is. And again, it's it's um, bona fide disease tolerance. There's no change whatsoever uh, in uh, pathogen burden. Um, it, uh, it is actually uh, tissue damage control. You see these markers of acute kidney injury, such as lipocalin um, and um, blood urea nitrogen are increased only when, really increased only when you delete emoxygenase one from renal proximal tubular epithelial cells. If you zoom in now into the kidney, you see the appearance of these very strong necrotic areas on renal proximal tubular epithelial cells. Um, and now we can go back to David Schneider's disease trajectories that I like so much. And here we plot in temperature, core body temperature, um, according to pathogen burden. And we're looking at mice that express HO1 or mice that do not express H1 in renal proximal tubular epithelial cells. Each um, lane is an individual mouse. And if you focus on the black lines here, they go like this. For example, this guy here comes here and then he comes all the way back. So he does exactly what David Schneider proposed, but this is in, the, in, in reality. Now the red ones are knocked out so they cannot catabolize in the kidney. And the circles is when they die, they all, die here, this, this guy here survived. And they die actually when the pathogen burden is at the maximum and the death caused by incatabolism in the kidney is associated with a tremendous drop on body temperature. And we're very interested on that and we can discuss why this would be. This is not random. If you look at the weight of the mice, it doesn't change. Uh, if you look at, um, Anemia, it does, uh, it does change, but it's much more subtle. Uh, so only a few parameters will change. And in this case, temperature is really uh, the main one. <clears throat> Martin, could you tell me how much time I have to decide how far should I go? 
Can you can you can you hear me? Yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, half an hour. Uh, uh, but oh, with, great. With passion. All right. Um, all right. So, so let me let me go back and dwell a little bit more on on the mechanism of how iron is involved in the specific case of uh, of malaria in the establishment of disease tolerance. And the reason why um, uh, no, because there was an echo, so just uh, I'm not sure whether. But uh, so basically, uh, you have half an hour, including the discussion. So if oh, you wrap up in yeah. two minutes, that would be great. Okay. So okay. So what I'm going to do is, um, all right. So I had 200 more slides to show you, and so that we can discuss. I wanted just to show you. I'm just going to show you the scheme and get to the conclusion. All right. So if we keep on uh, thinking of plasmodium, what we found in this paper that we just published, so you can read the details, is the following. And I think this would be interesting for us to discuss, which is plasmodium is, like other pathogens, a master of this guy. So we went to red blood cells, no MHG class 1, no class 2. He's keeping everything fine and not being uh, seen by the immune system. Now it does one capital scene, which is it leaks labile in. And in this manuscript, we found that labile in acts directly on the liver to control gluconeogenesis. And by doing that, it's stopping glucose from coming out from the liver. Now it turns out that plasmodium is totally dependent on glucose to keep proliferating. Right? So this is, this is, I think, a clear example of a non-immune cell providing resistance to infection. And no, it doesn't provide resistance to infection. Controlling the pathogen, you will see in a very subtle way, um, uh, uh, via mechanism that we're not used to contemplate. Now, one of the things that glycemia does is to control thermoregulation. And I alluded uh, into that uh, in the kidney. And by dropping body temperature, now plasmodium reads both glucose and body temperature. And this will change the virulence of the pathogen versus its transmission, which is the transmission is regulated by a developmental program that we can follow. So by looking at a, a, a bystander molecule such as EM or by sensing it, the liver is now controlling temperature and controlling glucose in a way that will make the metabolic behavior of the pathogen change. And this is the last point I wanted to take to tell you that uh, um, uh, disease tolerance involves this cooperation between um, host and pathogens in which they both adapt their metabolism so that they both can survive. And this idea, I should have put a reference there, I'm sorry, uh, was put forward originally by Janela Iris, and I think she's completely right about it. And she described this for bacteria. And we just described it now for plasmodium. I just want very quickly to really thank a uh, fantastic team with Adum. I would have no data to illustrate these concepts. And I'll be more than happy to discuss. Uh, I just unmuted when uh, popping stuff. Maybe, maybe you didn't hear, but uh, let, let's try and see whether you can hear people in the room. Can Maybe is there a question? Actually, so Judy, yeah, can you and let, let's let's test whether Miguel can hear you. Hi Miguel, it's Judy. Can you hear me? I can hear you very well, Judy. Nice Hi, it's you. been a long time. <laughs> um, yeah, I am a sort of a broad general question. Um, you started out by describing it as innate nutritional immunity, and then your whole talk kind of skimmed over the role of adaptive immunity until you mentioned it at the, you know, and you showed this this sort of um, schematic where adaptive immunity was just this like blip. And I guess my issue here is that, you know, nutritional immunity is heavily controlled by the adaptive immune system. It controls all these nutritional immune pathways. And presumably, you know, the resistance pathways are clearly uh, um, adaptive immune controlled and so on, presumably the tolerance pathways. So, um, you know, there is, I just am asking you to think about, uh, to say, you know, Clearly, the, everything you've talked about, which I believe and is fascinating, it has the adaptive immune system has a role to play. Yeah, I I agree with everything you're saying. So the the reason why we coined 
this actually <clears throat> with Gabriel Nunes innate uh, nutritional immunity is that innate immune cells actually are the cells, for example, for iron, which is where this is described in, in, in more detail. Um, they're the cells that are really expressing uh, most of the iron collators and, and these molecules that take iron. Um, now, I think you're completely right that adaptive immune cells must signal, for example, by interference uh, to, uh, to, for example, macrophages to make the systems much more robust. For example, we know that for the production of reactive uh, nitrogen species by uh, INOS, for example, if you activate a macrophage with LPS, we do a wimpy INOS, if you yeah. do interfering gamma, now it goes full blown. Uh, and that's the reason to call innate immunity. Not, it's not to, um, to ignore adaptive immune cells, but we've not been able yet to see how innate immune, or how adaptive immune cells are interacting with these systems. And it's not by lack of trying. Um, so we would have thought that Tregs are ideal for this, uh, but we, we've not found these type of mechanisms yet. Uh, perhaps, uh, as you alluded to in uh, earlier talks, uh, gamma delta T cells would be great to do this type of job, but they're not really adaptive. ILC. So we, we haven't been able actually to uh, to prove how adaptive immune cells operate here. I guess just more broadly, in in malaria, you know, the, when those you know the kids become infected, I mean. They rarely are infected naively, right? They're born to infected mothers who have immune systems, and so they come into an immune environment, and and then they, you know, the disease tolerance that develops in malaria is presumably immune mediated, right? I don't think so, actually. So then, yeah, okay. I would, no, no, so well, we are to discuss. So let's use the. <laughs> <laughs> um, I said the word think, okay? So I think, yeah. uh, so it's very difficult to prove to you that because the only way really to prove it, a little bit like for the um, innate memory concept when uh, Mihai uh, published, I think one of his first papers on that, on PNAS, <laughs> it's to use RAG knockout, it's to use brute force, right? So you take out all adaptive immunity and then you show that there's, for example, in our case, a survival advantage still by these mechanisms that could operate in the absence of adaptive immunity. The problem is that if you, when you take out adaptive immunity, you take out resistance mechanisms that are, they are in parallel operating there. Yeah. So it's difficult to prove uh, the, the, the involvement of adaptive uh, uh, immunity. We've done it for imoxygenase one in an old PNS paper, where we do see uh, imoxygenase one providing a survival adapt, adapt uh, a survival advantage uh, in the RAG background. And actually we're doing it again for another, uh, another work here, but, it, but it's difficult to prove technically. We haven't come up with, a, with the right way of doing it. Okay. I mean, conceptually, I struggled with the fact that if you had a very strong resistance mechanism that's T cell mediated, that it wouldn't be T cell mediated on the flip side to control that otherwise. I, I, guess, I'm, I guess I'm too, yeah. Never mind. Another time. Yeah. I think. Can I, <laughs> yeah. Can I just show you one? Yeah. One piece of that. I don't know if. Can I still? Sure. Share yeah. Screen? Yeah. 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 Uh, so, just as a counter argument of the need for adaptive immunity, I, I really think adaptive immunity is going to operate here. But let me give you an example where, <clears throat> where this does not seem to be the case. So you take these two black six mice. One you give it. One you give into you know in the left side and the other one you infect and then you do uh, run a sect from the liver and if you just focus here for the sake of time 40 percent of the genes that are regulated at the peak of plasmodium uh, infection are also regulated name by name by in itself and it turns out, I don't wanna, I don't wanna use uh, this time to feed you more slides, uh, it's published. It turns out that this regulation is essential to drop glucose and control virulence of the plasmodium. So this is an example where in by itself is, uh, is able to do this. Right. 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, lots of room for discussion. <laughs> Yes, uh, hello, thank you for the lecture. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well, very well, actually. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, maybe it's uh, simple, but um, if uh, the automotive uh, proliferates uh, when the glycemia levels are high, and uh, if we consider anorexia part of the uh, anti-infectious uh, response of the human body uh, physiologically. Uh, what is the role then for confirmed question and for sustained of glycemia in uh, such, uh, such basic infectious disease like malaria? All right, actually, I was hearing you a little bit bad. So if I start blabbing and not responding to your question, please interrupt me. I think I understood. So you're asking why anorexia? Yes, yes. Why anorexia of infection? How does that impact on glycemia? And how would that impact afterwards? You're touching exactly uh, the point, at least of our interest. So anorexia only develops really on severe uh, uh, infection, um, at least in mice. And it's really paradoxical because <clears throat> these mice are very sick. They, they need energy, if nothing else, to fuel their immune response. There might be kinetics here where adaptive immune cells already start proliferating at the peak of infection. They're not requiring glucose to do a, a glycolysis. But exactly at the same time, you're now shutting down glucose production from the liver. We see this is not specific to malaria. We see this for bacterial infection as well. So why would that be? We don't really know. What we know is that these mice start doing lipolysis. And, and then um, lipolysis becomes the rate limiting step for these mice to produce energy and survive both sepsis and malaria. So there seems to be a switch of, uh, of energy source from glucose into lipids. Now, the reason for that, again, I don't know, we're fascinated by it, but it could be a little bit in a, almost, a, almost as a joke, right? Which is you sense, you sense the pathogen and immediately what you do is that you take iron in. That's the nutritional immunity, right? We found it's not, it's not uh, depicted in, the, in this talk, that when you do this, you repress glucose production because you repress, repress gluconeogenesis. Now, the idea is that if you're taking a vital nutrient such as iron, you don't want to produce glucose because most microorganisms will use it to proliferate. So perhaps taking iron is sensed and linked to repression of glucose production so that you accomplish both at the same time. We also have very strong evidence to suggest that this pathway uh, is involved in the development of anorexia of infection. Am I answering your question or? or yes, I think it's only, uh, I wanted to uh, ask what would be the- I'm not hearing you well, I'm sorry. It's not your fault. It's probably still. Yeah. yeah hello. Thank you. Do you hear me now? Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so I wanted also to ask about the contra-regulatory mechanisms. What would the purpose of them in this context be? Like uh, cortisol, which is uh, um, enhancing. Uh, yeah. So I don't have data for cortisol uh, specifically, um, but I'm gonna try to answer your question with insulin, which is another one of these counter-regulatory uh, uh, mechanisms. So uh, the idea that I'm gonna put forward, uh, I think, uh, well, at least, I don't know if it's originally put forward by Ruslan Metzintov, but it's definitely very eloquently put forward by Ruslan. And the idea uh, is the following, is that the rules of metabolism and the homeostatic conditions are not the same ones 
as the rules of metabolism uh, in response to infection. So much of the circuitry that took us centuries to, to identify uh, and the steady state, it's not operational after infection. So for example, uh, let's focus on insulin, for example. So in this manuscript, in this last manuscript, if we um, uh, uh, treat mice uh, with streptosacin, uh, that actually kills beta cells of the pancreas. These mice cannot produce insulin and they become hyperglycemic uh, at steady state. The kinetics of glucose is exactly the same as the wild type. That means that they stop glucose production, they restart glucose production exactly in the same kinetics. Very suggestive with other data that we have there uh, that insulin is, it, it becomes second stage in the regulation of glucose metabolism in the context of infection. And I think we can do the argument for many other of these key molecules. So we don't know the rules of organismal metabolism in face of infection. And the general idea is that these pathways that operate in homeostatic conditions get short-circuited by signals emanating from cytokines and pattern recognition receptors. And when this happens, there's other pathways which are part of these stress responses that are required to realign the metabolism. Yeah. So very, very nice, Miguel. Actually, I wanted to ask about, about insulin. And um, we do develop the inflammatory processes insulin resistance. Is this an adaptive or maladaptive process, you think? Yeah, so that's... Um... That's, that's a mystery, right? So we were very puzzled by, by this data that I'm describing uh, uh, briefly, but in the, in the paper suggesting that insulin, uh, at least in malaria, is not critical to regulate uh, uh, glycemia. We do know, and you're completely right, that we develop insulin resistance. So insulin uh, must play a role. And the general idea is by developing insulin resistance, <clears throat> you're not consuming all the glucose. Mm -hmm. Um, so we don't, yeah, I mean, in short, I don't have, I don't have an answer for that. Um, we don't know how these systems are operating. So we have another mutation now, uh, that makes these mice and the same system become hyperglycemic. Um, and uh, it's, uh, something called Billy Burden reductase. And that's supposed actually to interact with the insulin receptor. I uh, would even dare to say, is there another hormone-like that acts via this receptor in response to infection? I, I don't, I don't know how to put it together, really. No, oh, I'm, I'm thinking, for example, when when you get a strong inflammatory reaction, you basically inhibit the uptake of glucose and the consumption, but you inhibit at the same time lipoprotein lipase. So you end up with a totally different source, as you mentioned earlier, I think. And I'm, I'm thinking, I don't know myself, I have no idea, but would it be advantages indeed to switch from glucose to other types of, uh, so for the, for the host to switch from glucose to other types of, uh, of um, fuel, basically, by inhibiting lipoprotein lipase, uh, uh, reducing free fatty acids and so on? Do you think that something like that is happening? Yeah, I think, I think that's exactly what's happening. So I'm not showing the data, but if we do knockouts for the lipolytic pathways in very specific compartments, these mice now succumb to infection. Mm -hmm. And when we look at these mice, they cannot produce glucose. They're doing lipolysis like crazy. So there's a, there's a crosstalk between these two pathways. But to go back to your original uh, question of, we would expect insulin to play, a, or a leptin to play predominant roles here, right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't look like. <laughs> so what are the molecules that, that do this? It's, uh, it's really mysterious, perhaps. I mean, I'm throwing it back to Judy Allen again. So perhaps these are products of uh, uh, innate or adaptive immune cells mm -hmm. that, that either short circuit this steady state signal to reduction pathways or provide molecules that are specifically adapted to that. Perhaps I will add something that's also very eloquently put by Ruslan, which is, but I think it's very profound even for therapeutics of infectious diseases, which is um, we take uh, these variable parameters, for example, glucose at steady state 
they have an upper and lower limit, right? And if you have a, a, a patient that develops sepsis, and you correct me, uh, Mihai, I think the, the clinical attitude is to say, if, if they become hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic, you correct the glycemia to put it back to the homeostatic level. Yes, there were, there were several clinical trials. And they all fail. So, yeah, some of them, yeah, some of them tried actually successfully and some of them failed, yes. Yeah. So another idea is that you should not restore it to the homeostatic levels. You should restore it. We can do this in mice to the levels that mice establish as an upper and lower limit during the infection. Because mm -hmm. the rules changed. So mice drop glycemia, that's an adaptive response against bacterial infection and also against malaria. If we bring glycemia up, because under homeostasis, it was another level, actually they, they can die. If they drop it lower than the threshold level, they would also die. So basically the rules during acute, the, the short periods of acute infection change and the upper and the lower boundaries of these vital variables changes. And we don't know at what level we should put temperature, glycemia. Yeah. But how, how much do you think yeah, there is also a difference between the type of animals that we are? For example, mice are, uh, they don't actually develop fever, they actually yeah. develop much more hypothermia during infection, whereas we as humans develop uh, the complete opposite fever. And, and also the hypoglycemia that we see in the mice, I'm not so sure that we see it just as in, in the same fashion in humans. So I, I'm wondering how much is the difference between the host as well? That's a, that's a real critical issue. Uh, I, I'm gonna go straight to the end of the possible conclusions that are mice uh, uh, valuable to study this metabolic adaptation? I think they are. Um, so the question you're asking is that this hypometabolic response that we see in mice, does it represent what we see in humans? We don't know yet. Um, one possibility is that both the hypometabolic in rodents and perhaps the hypermetabolic in humans serve the same purpose, which is to change the variables upper and lower to different levels to adapt to infection. Mm -hmm. But we don't know uh, because, for example, in sepsis, now that we, we've been looking more carefully, there's a fraction of individuals that, for example, develops uh, um, hypothermia, for example, and hypoglycemia as well. But it's not the prevalent response. Well, but I, I'll leave it. We don't know. We don't well, know to what extent yeah. the, the mice use the same strategy as humans. One, one last question, Miguel, because I don't know actually. In, in humans, we develop insulin resistance to the infection. But do May I, do, do you mind? Sorry. Sure, sure, sure. In, 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 in humans, we develop insulin resistance uh, during infections, but do mice also develop insulin yeah. resistance? I don't know. They do, actually. They do. So there's, oh, okay. there's very good work from uh, Janela Iris Laboratory uh, showing insulin resistance against bacterial infection. Um, and I don't, uh, I, you know, I cannot say that this malaria is exactly the same thing as, as that previous work, but I suspect that there's other molecules that are interfering, but mice to develop insulin resistance, that's important for them, but I don't know where to put, I don't know if this apparent lack of insulin playing a role is specific to malaria or whether there's other molecules that operate uh, uh, in acute infection. Maybe I can make just a short comment on this uh, so because I think I know the study that you're referring to. Um, so it's a model of the Citrobacter rodentium infection where um, that's correct. Yeah, if you if you if you feed them iron, then uh, this 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 makes them survive even the LD one hundred uh, uh, protocol. Absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it works by inducing insulin resistance, leading to glucose availability, increasing glucose availability in the lumen of the, of the gut. And this actually then um, basically leads to lower virulence of the cytobacter and um, even has an evolutionary effect because then it selects those strains that are less virulent and leads to ultimately to asymptomatic infection in these mice. Uh, but uh, 
as it, at the expense of more transmission on the population level, as, as far as I remember. So, yes, but Martin, so now I amplified, man, I managed to amplify, and I know that's you talking. Uh, I find amazing that complete different uh, uh, infection models, we see iron interacting with glucose metabolism. That paper is, uh, in the discussion makes a big argument that what counts as insulin resistance versus what we had shown before, there was uh, liver gluconeogenesis. That's not trivial biologically, of course, but it's trivial on the bigger picture of having iron regulating glucose metabolism in a way that affects actually, uh, uh, in this case, uh, pathogen virulence and transmission. Yeah. Thanks. So perhaps we're touching a very general uh, uh, biological uh, reaction. If I may, so yes, to that, uh, yeah, so uh, hi, Miguel. Uh, I wanted to really add to that, uh, that uh, you know, for my previous uh, talk, that uh, the um, inflammation, like you know, active uh, immune cells can infiltrate, like you know, a metabolic uh, organs such as uh, adipose tissue or even uh, liver. So I don't know in these cases you could look at actually also the other organs how they are impaired because that could also lead to this uh, dysregulation of uh, glucose utilization and uh, metabolic uh, uh, you know uh, homeostasis because that's also really interesting aspect like you know just how inflammation or like you know infectious disease can uh, affect also this uh, glucose metabolism and how this glucose uh, is need to be uh, you know taken by immune cells or these metabolic cells. Absolutely. So a great example of that is that, uh, uh, I was gonna say a lot of pathogens, perhaps all of them, they love to go to the adipose tissue. There must be a reason for that. Um, bacteria do that, uh, plasmodium does that, trypanosomes do that and so on. Uh, why have they chosen to go there? Perhaps we don't have time to discuss in detail, but if nothing else, that would be a good source of nutrients. And the cells that are there, the immune cells, they're not geared to clear pathogens. They're much more geared to sustain uh, uh, tissue function. We are favoring another hypothesis, not to the exclusion of what you're saying. We're favoring the hypothesis that this is actually controlled by the central nervous system, which is the organ that is the best to coordinate metabolic function in every single other organ. And we have some evidence uh, uh, for that. So we think that um, uh, these metabolic changes, first of all, are sensed uh, uh, by specific neurons uh, in the central nervous system. We have now very good evidence by a very talented person in my lab called Jamil Kikoto, Kitoko, sorry, uh, that for example, in can induce that. Uh, and then this is feedback uh, to different organs to control, if nothing else, temperature, uh, lipolysis, and glucose production, in, and anorexia. That, so that's the way we're favoring. We're favoring the hypothesis of a central regulator, but not to the exclusion of what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you. We also, we also have a question on Zoom. Uh, so I'm going to read it to you if, if, if you, uh, you know. Absolutely. Can. Use this microphone to make it better, hopefully. Uh, so the question reads as follows. I would like to, uh, first of all, thank you. Very nice talk. I would like to, uh, you to comment on the possible way in which physiological tolerance could be conceptualized beyond uh, infectious context. I'm just curious, is it possible or would be uh, inappropriate? Let's say, for example, in mental health disorders, what would be necessary to take this concept to, to be operational? All right, I'm going to keep the mental uh, the, the me, uh, mental health disorders to to the last part. Uh, we we I think we grow up as a society and as scientists with things being good or not good, and in biology that doesn't exist. Things serve a purpose and they carry a trade off. Um, so uh, resistance serves a purpose to clear pathogens and the trade-off, let's call it immunopathology. Now, if disease tolerance was good, why aren't we all tolerant to everything? And obviously we're not. First of all, if we become tolerant to a pathogen, at the extreme, that pathogen ceases to be a pathogen because it no longer carries a fitness cost. 
Now, pathogens use disease tolerance for a purpose, which is fantastic, uh, <laughs> which is to transmit. And I think uh, the best example, uh, it's the last two years, SARS-CoV-2 compared to SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-1 could only transmit when it was very deep in the lungs and the pathology was very severe. If anyone comes with that type of pathology next to you, it's usually pale, it's sweating, it carries fever and can hardly talk. You do avoidance. You, you seclude yourself from this very highly transmitting person. And SARS-CoV-2 was stopped in Hong Kong almost because it couldn't transmit. SARS-CoV-1 evolved uh, in a way that it does not cause severe disease for quite some time and very rarely. Right? So it is transmitting from healthy carriers. And it's for sure that uh, uh, it uses disease tolerance uh, strategies so that the carrier can go around and keep transmitting. That's the big trade-off of, uh, of disease tolerance. Now, as for the mental health, I, I have to say, I don't understand the, the, the question. I, I, at least like I, my, my brain cannot make the leap to uh, mental health disorders with disease tolerance. All right. Um... Yeah, Dominic. Uh, yeah, so. Hi, Miguel, Dominic. Uh, actually, beautiful Hi, story you. and very nice, and it's, it's still developing. So, thank you. Expectations. Uh, the question I, it's a, just a collateral question, probably naive. Uh, so, <laughs> immunometabolism is affected also by microbiota. Have you tried your experiments in germ-free mice? The result would be the same or not? So. I, I'm sort of curious of this probably naive question. Does the infectious agent or microbiota also interact? So they know they are on the both sides of the of the intestine. Do they communicate or probably stupid question? But no, no there's nothing stupid about. It. So uh, simple question. When when anyone says this is a very naive and simple question, I think every speaker goes like, "Oh my God, here comes the important question." <laughs> <laughs> So those are those are very deep questions. The first one are the first one I'm interpreting is that what is the role of the microbiota in this disease tolerance mechanism? So we now all accept that it plays a major role in the development and function of the immune system as it relates to resistance to to infection. Um, this has been shown, for example, for, by different labs. But yeah, I'm going to give an example from my lab, but it's not necessary. We all know that. Uh, I think it will play a, a, an equal role on disease tolerance. There, the formal demonstration of that is actually uh, originally made uh, in Drosophila by a, a dear friend and colleague of mine here at the Gulbenkian Institute called Luis Teixeira. And he has proven that Drosophila has a, have an endosymbiont called Volbache. Every insect has that. And actually, uh, Luis de Chere has shown that Volbachia uh, promotes disease tolerance to uh, viral infections in insects, which is a really seminal uh, discovery because it addresses exactly a question that interaction with symbionts, with commensals, uh, actually regulates disease tolerance to a very virulent pathogen. Uh, that was followed up by an excellent paper by Janela Iris, where she finds a complete different system that gut microbiota also uh, uh, affects disease tolerance mechanisms. So for the first part of your question, that has been proven. The devil is in the details. Who does that? How does that operate? It's, it's a fascinating uh, uh, venue of, uh, of research, let's call it like that. You've also asked whether the bacteria once they're inside, they communicate to the ones outside. Well, the, the, there's a general feeling uh, based on data that these very um, profound systemic infections, they change the gut uh, permeability and they make it more leaky uh, to components of the microbiota. So that might be a way how microbes that become systemic are communicating with the ones that are not systemic by making them also systemic, but I, I don't know of more information about that. Yeah, I mean, for example, when they, for example, fight for the iron, mm. apparently the iron would be sort of limited supply for both sides. So are they going to have in competition or 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't. Uh, there is this thing of anorexia of infection interrupting every, all the all the input. Um, might be even because of that, right? Never thought about it this way. So, so let's imagine you have an infection which became systemic, but you're still getting iron. That's going to impact on components of the gut microbiota in a way that perhaps the organism could not withstand. Or, but but I'm just talking about iron, but one could think of every type of nutrient. So it's anorexia controlling expansion of pathobionts in the microbiota. Uh, I don't think this was ever explored. I never thought about it this way. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so we are basically out of time, but um, I can't resist um, still one more question. Um, it's a very simple one. Actually, it's something I've been struggling in when reading uh, many of your papers. So the tissue damage control, is that uh, supposed to refer both to resistance and tolerance? Or um, what's the relationship? Because, uh, um, yeah, so could you clarify? I'm very that? glad you asked that. So we we spent some time trying to coin this. And uh, and this was always refused for my abstracts. But so damage control, it's used in different fields. So in naval uh, uh, <laughs> literature, uh, it's everything you need to do uh, to avoid that the boat is sinking after an accident. Uh, in surgery, apparently, damage control is everything the surgeon needs to do when there's a, a bleeding in surgery. To avoid death of the patient. The one I like the most is the um, the one in Marvel Comics when the superheroes fight with the supervillains. We never think about it, but they destroy the whole city. So there's a company called Damage Control that repairs everything. Uh, so so damage control we put it in the trans and immunology, but uh, damage control if it operates in a cell that that is not involved in resistance, damage control would be the basis of disease tolerance. So let's think about, for example, renal proximal tubal epithelial cells. You have this NRF2, HO1, ferritin, and God knows what. It makes the kidney keeps functioning because the role of the renal proximal tubal epithelial cell is reabsorption of nutrients, right? So damage control there is has nothing to do with resistance, but, in macrophages, for example, um, I'm, I don't know why it came to my mind now, the work of uh, Lalita Hamanikan uh, in tuberculosis. So macrophages, they need to protect themselves from the cytotoxicity imposed by tuberculosis to be able actually to clear the pathogen. So the same stress responses in that context will contribute to resistance to infection. And that's what we try to put in a very complicated type of scheme that I need to come up years after and perhaps with a more simple version of that. So the, yeah, it depends on what cell compartment it's operational. Uh, yeah, thanks. So I think this clarifies it for me because I, I remember reading like in, um, that you make the distinctions in um, the stress responses in parenchyma working somewhat differently, uh, right. possibly from the responses in immune cells, like uh, uh, HIF-1A uh, alpha um, activation in... Uh, in yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a great yeah. example. Yeah. All right. Yeah, thanks. And uh, with that, uh, we now thank again. No, I thank you for organizing this. And uh, I'm really, really uh, sad that I'm not there with you uh, for the discussions and dinners and hopefully there'll be another occasion. <laughs>